Hello, CPB Network. Today I'm joined by a very special guest, Coach John Cofino. Thank you very much, Coach, for, for joining me and just sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. It's good to be here, Chris. Long time, man. I, I, uh, I miss talking to you. Yeah, definitely. Me too, Coach. Me too. It's great to have you on here and finally catch up a little bit. Um, you know, to start it off, let's just go back and, and take it back to when you first started your coaching career. I know it's been a long journey for you, but if you can go back and kind of tell us what kind of started this whole international career for you. Well, I mean, I stumbled into coaching. You know, I don't know um, that I ever really wanted to be a coach. I love basketball since a, a, an early age you know, six, seven years old. And, mm -hmm. and then I, after I left high school, I, I didn't go to college for a long time. And then I started to go to this community college in, in, in New York, Westchester Community College. And uh, I said, what the heck, let me try out for the team, you know? And I go out for the team and every, every practice I'd have to run out, the, <laughs> run, I'd have to run out in the hallway and throw up, you know, <laughs> it was really tough. It was really tough. I've never played organized ball before. And, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I was working, I was going to school, but I really got into it and I was in great shape and and the coach wanted to give me a uniform and he, I, I made the team. I was the only white guy on the team and it was really a great experience. And um, the next year, because I was a little older than most of the players, he said, to, he brought me in the office uh, and he said, you know, uh, you could play another year in, 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 in junior college, but we have a spot open on the, on the, uh, on the coaching staff. And I think that this is uh, something that, you know, you're going to be good at. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And he wouldn't let me d take it right away. He wanted me to think about it for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. and little did I know I was working under a legend, you know, Ralph Arietta, who's in like five Hall of Fames and got over a thousand wins and coached over 30 something years and been to over 10 national championships. And so I was lucky. I was just very yeah. lucky. And that's how I got started. And, and I did a lot of recruiting and I got into it and really started to network and I started to work camps and I was pounding the pavements in the city and, and, and bringing players up for him to, to talk to. And we put together a great team and we went, we won the region uh, my first year. I said, this is good stuff. <laughs> well, yeah. Wow. What a great apprenticeship to be under a coach. Yeah, like that. exactly, man. He was, he was, and still is my mentor. One of my mentors that I, you know, he follows my career to this day and we talk once a week and he said, I'm going to see you in the garden and on TV. And he was right. He was wow. right. You know, and, and everything he said, you know, I didn't always agree with, when I was a young rookie coach, mm -hmm. but you know, I see it now. I see the yeah. big picture now instead of like, you know, handling a situation and, and, and dealing with something and then worrying about, you know, the little things which you do worry about, but the, he, he, he always had his eye on the big picture and, and how, how everything's going to end up. And, and uh, I learned a lot from him and, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I was getting, working hard there and I own a college asked if they could talk to me about my me going to school and they'll pay for my education and they wanted me on the staff and we went to the NCAs my first year there at Iona and it was crazy man it was just crazy the Niagara asked Jeff Rulin if I could talk to them move up in a different spot and I just kept moving up and you know worked at the division one level for nine years and and after that I, I went to the NBA development league and, and with, with Jeff Rulin and then I became the head coach there and it was a great great experience and three years in the NBA Development League and left there. Um, financially, the team was struggling. And um, so I, after this third season, I, re I, re I resigned. And then mm -hmm. I started I started scouting for the NBA. Wow, very uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was scouting for the NBA draft in, um, you know, um, in California, going to a bunch of college games. It was great sitting on the floor at big games, cool. UCLA, USC. You know, it was really, really cool. And, and then I got the call to coach overseas. Uh, actually, I actually... Before I got the call, this is a, a really interesting story. Before I got the call to go to Qatar, I get a call on my phone, and it's Mitch Kupchak, GM of the Lakers. I went, wow. I almost passed out. I'm like, wow. <laughs> he goes, hey, John, how's it going? I understand you're living in L.A. now. I go, yeah. He goes, listen, do you know where my office is? I go, yeah, where, where the D-League plays, right, the, 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 your practice facility. And, you know, in El Segundo. He goes, yeah, yeah, come see me tomorrow. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm getting a Laker job? 
So I go there and I sit in his office and he's got all these names on the board with salaries and the assistant GM who's a friend of mine's there and mm-hmm. Quinn Snyder's there who's a friend of mine. He's an assistant oh, wow. at the Lakers and it was like unbelievable. And he, and he was like, let me ask you something, John. Would you ever coach high school basketball? And I said, well, it'd be tough to coach out here, man. It's so expensive to live and they don't pay. High school coaches don't make much. He says, how's 100000 I go, Wow. He says, my son's coach just quit at his school, and they're looking for a coach. I'm not going to tell him to hire you, but I want I want you to interview. So he got me an interview, um, you know, at uh, Brentwood, you know. Um, yeah. And um, they said I did great, and there was just one other guy that I was fighting over, and he got the job. So that's when I went to Qatar. Okay. Um, coach, you know, not to, not to stop your progress here, can we take it back to the very beginning when you were a young coach starting out, um, yeah. I think that there's so many guys that they want to get into coaching uh, as, as a youngster. And they just, you know, they feel that, OK, they didn't have this elite playing background. They're not somebody's son, you know, and they feel like maybe it's impossible that, you know, how, how did you navigate? Because obviously you had these great experiences that you kept moving up and up and up. Uh, you know, how did you navigate that as a young coach? You know, I've, I've, I often give advice to younger younger um, uh, people about coaching, that people that want to get into coaching. And my, some of my former players to this day, I got an email yesterday about one of my players, uh, David Brooks, who wants to get into coaching. He's living in Serbia. And, uh, you know, I told him to get his coach's li- license and then come with me to some camps. But you know, the bottom line is, Chris, A, I was, I was very lucky. I was very lucky. Um, I wasn't a, 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 a great player. But I studied the game, and my head coach, he said, you got to go to work camps and get networking and meet people, Mm -hmm. and I did that. Um, He said, it's all about getting the players, John, and and the bottom line is you have to be in a lawyer. You have to pay your dues. You have to pay your dues as a loyal assistant. No matter what the coach says, you, you are working for him, and you are there to make his life easier. And these things stuck with me, you know, and I found that some young coaches don't they don't want to. They want to skip that step. They want. They want to. Mm-hmm. They want to move down the down the bench, you know, to the to the end of the bench and be head coach right away. And you got to pay your dues. You have to know what it's like to be an assistant. If you're gonna, if you're gonna supervise assistants, you have to know what they're going through, what to mm-hmm. expect from them. It's like managing players. But the main thing is, pay your dues. Put your time in. I I, I was getting. I wasn't getting paid much at Westchester. I was getting paid nothing at Iona because they were paying for my tuition, you know, and then little by little, I got paid, you know, another story we'll talk about internationally in Kenya, I got paid $70 a week. So you got to pay your dues yeah. and and you become more humble You and, and learn yeah. all aspects of the game. And I did everything between team travel, videotaping, scouting, practice, you know, everything, everything, meals, recruiting, uh, academics, you, ha- you have to learn all aspects of the game and be well-rounded. And But the main thing, pay your dues and, and, and network yourself. Really, anybody you meet, send them an email, send them a, a message right away. No, exactly, Coach. I think that's great advice because, you know, a coach for them to vouch for you to another school and say, hey, you need to hire this guy. Well, he needs to believe in you and have seen loyalty in you. And like you said, Coach, you were doing all these responsibilities – you have to wear multiple hats in any program, no matter how high the budget is. Um, that was really great advice, Coach. So not to cut you off, can you please no. continue with starting starting your career overseas and maybe how how yeah, I mean, and how different that was from coaching at a college in the States and also <laughs> well, in the D League? Yeah, just a quick point on that other one, Chris. You know, a coach is not going to endorse you if because that's his reputation. Right. If you're not, if you're not you know – the type of coach that they're looking for. You know, like, I remember one coach talking to me and saying, well, you love Jim Beheim and you love this guy, but would, would, you, would, you, would you be loyal to them? You know, and I said, yeah, I would. I would. But in, a lot of coaches know that young coaches are moving up the ladder and, and they want to they wanna get to the highest level, but I didn't do it for that. I just It just happened, and I, did, I never got rich off it, but I got, I, you know what? I was doing what I loved, and my—I never forget my first 
when I got my first job, my family said, your ship has come in. This is what you want to do. I could see it. You're passionate. This is what you want to do. Once you get bit by that coaching bug, you, yeah. you, 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 uh, it's, it's hard to get rid of, you know? Yeah, so right, anyway, sure. so I get the job in Qatar from a, from a contact, from a network. And uh, it took me a long time to get the contract and to get the plane ticket. In, you know, um, and I made my first mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was my first job overseas. And my first mistake was not doing my homework on the club. So I get out there. Well, well, well basically, before I get out there. I'm sorry, uh, Coach. I got a little little visitor here with me. I apologize. Sounds like it. a monkey. Put a- <laughs> He's a, little, he's a little puppy. I We get stuck, I think, in, in uh, somewhere in Dubai or something. I think we got stuck in Dubai because there, there was something going on in Qatar. But anyway, I get there. Uh, I get picked up, and they put me in this um, apartment, which was really seedy. Mm-hmm. Um, they bring me in in, like, September. And I think back then there was, like, one religious holiday – it was Ramadan or something. And then another religious holiday was called Eid Mubarak. Um, so everything was shut down. And then after that came, in between that came the Arab Games. They were the host. Doha, Qatar was the host of the Arab Games. It's kind of like the Olympics, but all Arab countries, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, you know. So I went to all the basketball games and I saw all the national teams. It was really cool. Uh, but but they brought me in too early. I mean, we didn't start until like December, January. And and when we did, I had one American that I didn't recruit and they wouldn't let me bring in the guy I wanted to. And um, the rest were Qataris who had, who had day jobs and would come maybe five, Five or six of them would come to practice at night. Yeah, yep, I know how that goes. And it was frustrating. It was frustrating. So we had this, um, we had a long weekend off. And my sister, who's a uh, Hollywood producer, she, she, she calls me and says, I'm sending a camera crew to Dubai, which is 45 minutes away. We're going to film uh, an interview with Tom Cruise. He's scaling some big building off of Mission Impossible or something. She goes, I, I could pay you as a production assistant. I'll fly you there, put you up in a hotel, and, and you can make some money. I says, that's perfect. I'm off this weekend. So I go to tell them. And they said, no, you can't go. You won't come back. I go, you got to be kidding me. I, I had a big fight with them. But the bottom line was they held my passport. Okay? Oh, wow. And when you when you when you work in those kinds of countries, mm-hmm. you're sponsored by somebody. So your sponsor has your passport. Ooh. And that turned out to be a nightmare because when I started working and coaching, they weren't paying me. So I told them I'm going to the embassy and they didn't want any confrontation. So finally, after fighting with them for like three weeks, they finally says, OK, if you want to leave this country, you have to. Get this sheet of paper, go to the Olympic Federation building and get 22 signatures. I'm like, what? I don't speak Arabic fluently, you know. So I had some guy come with me and we, we, it took us weeks, man, to get signatures. Come back tomorrow, come back Tuesday. You're on the wrong floor, go to the 36th floor. I finally was down to two signatures and my bag was packed and uh, I left. I left and they gave me my passport, my immigration, customs, all that. And I had a 24-hour layover in Dubai, so I stayed there for a night. But it, it was a nightmare, and, and I advise people never, ever, ever give up your passport, ever. Yes, I you agree. Could, you give them a copy, you can let them take a picture, but you get you get that right back. The minute they have that, you are not going anywhere. You, I was hostage. I was yeah, hostage. no kidding. God, that's so scary. It, it got a little scary my first job, so I went home. Were you yeah. apprehensive at all, like going into that, being, you know, it's a Middle Eastern country and you hear some scary stuff? Yeah. You know, it's fun. It's not funny. This is 2010. So I get there and they're, everybody's dressed in their, you know, what they wear. You know, they wear their white garb and the, and the headdress. And, mm-hmm. um, and I'm like, the ignorant person that I was, I, I was like, look at all these terrorists. You know? <laughs> oh, man. 
You know, they're all dressed like that. And that's what you see on TV. And that, you know, right. you don't know. We, you know, we don't know the right, the, you know. So I'm like, okay, calm down, calm down. They're just normal people. And I go my first night sleeping in my apartment, 3.30 in the morning. The prayers come on the loudspeakers with the loudest noise. I jumped because I was, first of all, my, top, my, top, my clock was messed up to begin with. So, but it scared the heck out of me. You know, when I had to call the prayers, I look out the window and I see everybody walking to the mosque and everything. And I'm like, holy, what an experience. And, you know, everything was, it was just, you know, I got used to it and it was hot and they drank a lot of tea and I got dehydrated. I got, I got kidney stones while I was out there. And, oh, wow. um, but um, I learned a lot about the culture, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was my first, you know, Chris, to get to your point, it was my first international job. So, yeah. so during one game. It was like halftime or something, and, and guys are not warming up, and I'm getting upset. And I always had like three of the people that ran the team sit behind my bench. They were like the big shots, you know? Yeah. And I'm yelling, where is everybody? Get, we got to warm up. It's only a couple minutes left. And they said, Coach, calm down. It's time to pray. And everybody was upstairs oh. praying. So it was really mind-blowing. Like I was like, oh. Yeah. And then during the game – one of the one of the things that really blew me away was I was trying to call a timeout to the referee and he kept looking at me. He kept looking at me. He kept looking at me. And I'm saying, time out. Why are you ignoring me? And finally, they, they tapped me on the shoulder. They said, you got to go over to the table. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, God, that's embarrassing. And then it was this is just little different rules that are different. Um compared to the American rules, you know, like the 10 second backcourt and which yep. is eight seconds internationally. You can't throw the ball in the backcourt. Right. You can't even block a shot from behind where they're going to call like an intentional foul, even though oh, if it's a clean yeah. block, you know, it's like, it's with that. but that's what I tell the players, you know, you got to know the rules because it's, it could really cost you. And if you throw the yeah. ball in the backcourt, which everybody can do in America, you can't do that. Yeah. It makes you look bad as a player. It makes you also look like an inexperienced rookie. And also, you know, I've seen this many times. You, you go out there to, to a country, especially like Qatar, and you start complaining and showing, showing your colors and everything. It only makes you look worse. Nobody's going to understand and see your point of it. You are a foreigner. People look at you, and they're going to judge you right away. They don't know what you're saying. And if you respond that way and not keep your head, it's going to only be bad for you as a yeah, player. Yeah, you'll have a short career because, you know, the, the problem that Americans have is they go over there and they think they're – you know, they're, they're hot, you know, and they think they're, they're, they're the best. And, yeah. and I tell people, listen, trust me when I tell you, you're the first guy to go if they don't like right. you. You could score right. 30 points a game. You have to adjust to them. Right. It's their country. It's their culture. And also the game is played differently and, and officiated differently. The whole attitude, the whole mindset. Yeah. Yes. You know, they don't. You know, they don't want to go to the gym every day and get shots up or whatever. They don't want to work out that hard, you know. Right. So, I mean, th there's a misconception um, for Americans when, when they first come over overseas that, you know, they're just going to go there and, and do their thing and yep. play, play. You know, I don't I don't tell them to change their style, but I do tell them to change their attitude, for you know, sure. because and to ease into it, ease into it, learn the culture, learn the people, because I learned the hard way, too. You know, when I went to China. My jokes didn't fly so well. My jokes weren't funny, you know? So I was like, okay, I better just chill and, and just, you know, be part of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're not home. You're not home. And if there's more than one American, I always tell them to stick together. Always stick together, you know, and, and, and watch each other's backs because you never know. You, you, you're, you guys are outsiders. And um, yep. so I think it's good to prep these guys. I tell them to do their homework. And, and and talk to other players that have played for these clubs and, well, coaches that have played. You know, so go, going back to the Qatar, when I got there, I, I get an email um, from a former coach. He goes, Coach, you need to get on that plane and get and leave. He goes, that, that club you're working for is the worst. Oh, wow. And I went, nah, you know, I was like, I didn't know the guy. And I was like, nah, you, nah I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. You know, he goes, okay, I'm just telling you, I was there. And, you know, this is this and this and this. And I, and I should have, you know. He was right. Yeah, man, that's was, scary. You know, and um, but I made a lot of friends out there, and I, I wound up working as a substitute teacher in the American school. So it was pretty. Wow. It was cool. You know, I, I enjoyed myself, and 
that's the only uh, income I was making because they weren't paying me. You know, they weren't okay. paying. Me. And so it, it was a. Oh, I was making other money too. I shouldn't say that. You made me think about something. So one of the one of the veteran players says, "Hey, they need some an expert mm-hmm. at the NBA, and uh, and about Eurobasket. They need somebody to talk about it on the TV station." I go, "Okay, what what oh, station?" Cool. I said, "What station?" He goes, "They'll give you five hundred dollars for like twenty minutes of work." I go, "Get out of here." He goes, "Yeah, I'm telling you, every Monday." So I says, "Tell him I'll do it. I'll Definitely, do it." Yeah. So. I call up the producer. It was a, uh, where was he from? Beirut. You know, he was from Lebanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, he spoke very well English. He goes, hey, here's what you got to do. You bring your car in. They're going to check it three times. They're going to go through it. They're going to tear it apart three times. (laughs) And my car was the car that they gave me. It was a Camry, which when you fill up the gas, costs about $8 because oil grows like water. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But a glass of, a bottle of water costs more than that. Really? Yeah, because we're in the desert, you know? The water costs more than the oil. Wow. It was really weird. But anyway, this state TV station was called Al Jazeera. No way. So me, being my ignorant person, Al Jazeera, that's the terrorist network. That's where Bin Laden used to talk on, right? He used to to make his announcements. I was like, oh, my God. They go, no, no, it's a, it's a regular station. It was founded in Qatar. Right. They, have a, they, have a, they have an office in Washington, D.C. I go, right. cool. Yeah. So I did all my homework. I did NBA stuff. I was on a computer. I was looking at Euro. It was the playoffs in Eurobasket. It was like down to the Final Four. And, I've ha- and I, the hostess was this beautiful Lebanese woman. So I, I go on every Monday. And, mm-hmm. they, and they have like a, an earpiece that was speaking to me in English. Mm-hmm. And they were translating my words into Arabic. And they and they kept telling me, slow down, slow down. You're talking too fast. <laughs> that must have been an awesome opportunity. That sounds really it, cool to be commenting. It was, it was not only easy money, but I look forward to the hostess, man. She was so pretty. <laughs> oh, she was a Lebanese woman. My goodness. Might be the pre- – I don't know, man. Anyway, so I made money there and I made money at the school and, um, and, until I left. And uh, mm-hmm. I went – I was – it was like late January, and uh, I went to the Final Four in New Orleans um, with my brother. And uh, I'm walking down the stairs in the Superdome, and I see Jimmer Fredette's coach walking up towards me, and we start talking. And he says, "Hey, they're looking for a coach uh, in Albany. You know, you remember the old Albany Patroons where Phil Jackson coached and yeah. and George Call?" And I go, "Yeah, they. You'd be perfect for them." So I, I, okay, I need a job. And I went there, and it was great. It, it, it was just a part-time thing. We went to the cha- went to the national championships that year in Vegas in the Vegas Summer League. I went up to George Call because I was sitting with his son Kobe, and I said, "Coach Call, what does this have in common? You know, Bill Musselman, Phil Jackson, George Call, John Cofino." He goes, "Who's John Cofino?" I go, "That's me." <laughs> he goes, "We all coached the Albany Patroons." He goes, "Oh, I love that place." So, and then, uh, you know, from there I got a job in Kenya. It, 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 that's a, that was probably the most satisfying and gratifying coaching of my career in well, Kenya. To go back to, to real quick to the Albany thing, you know, that team has been resurrected, if, if, if you haven't noticed, with, uh, you know, Coach uh, David Magley's new league, the, the basketball league. He was the former commissioner of the NBL Canada yeah, um, not sure if you remember him doing some of some yeah. of my events. Um, yeah, yeah, the workouts. Yeah, that, yeah. He started that league with his with his wife. Uh, you know, just to just to kind of plug their league and send that message out. The the Albany Patroons is one of the best programs in it, and I think they even maybe they won it the first year or finished second. I'm not sure. Yeah, I've uh, heard that they might be even using the old gym that they used to use. They downtown. are. They are. Yeah. You know, yep. we didn't. We were using some high school. We were the Albany Legends. Because mm-hmm. something with the name rights or something—I don't know—but it was a great experience. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. That. So no, no, that's cool. That's, that's good. I'm glad to see they're still going. Yeah, I had, I had some great—I had some really good players on that team. So I'm sitting home, and my friend Jim Klibinoff, who's—he's the—he's the, um, he, the head of scouting for the Denver Nuggets now, who I used to work for. I used to work for him when he was uh, had the scouting service for the NBA draft. Okay. And he says, my friend in England. Over in the UK, needs a coach in Africa. His son has an academy, and they need someone with old school, tough ideas like you. 
they can't pay you much, but they house you and they give you three meals a day. I go, Africa? Why not? <laughs> I like so that I, attitude. So I Skype with him. Yeah. And we hit it off. Me and the guy, Robbie Pierce, what a good guy. He, 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 I didn't realize he was a legend in, in, in the United Kingdom, basketball-wise. But we hit it off, and he goes, listen, I'm going to be straight up with you. It's $70 a week. We have a living, uh, we have a maid that cooks and cleans and does your clothes and everything. And you, you'll have your own room upstairs in a house with about 18 African players. Wow. And uh, he convinced me, and I went there, and the first two weeks was really uh, tough. Uh, I was tough on them. I was throwing guys out of practice because they were laughing. They were coming late and this and that. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, the guys were on t not only on time, they were there before me. I, I, we, we used That's to practice great. outside in the in the heat of a, of a church, a church's parking lot. We, we made courts. And um, across the street was a pig slaughterhouse. You could hear them squealing and smell. It smelled so bad. Oh, oh Anyway, we practiced twice a day. We used to run about a mile and a half to the, to the place and we started winning games and we won the league. We won the league. Wow, that's awesome. And uh, but again, seventy dollars a week wasn't cutting it. I was starting to use my own money, and um, it, it wasn't expensive to live there. But I was like a white coach, and and the only white coach, the mm -hmm. only white coach in the whole like country, <laughs> practically. Yeah. And you'd walk down the street, and little kids with their mothers, they would they would like tug on their mother and say, "Mommy, mommy, look." Yeah, look. yeah, of course. Look at the Mazungu, Mazungu, yeah. Mazungu, and I said, "What is Mazungu?" They go, "That means white man." <laughs> I, I felt like a freak. So, so I said to I said to the kid that was running it, Daniel Pierce. Uh, he, he's such a great kid, and he's opening up a new one in Uganda, by the way. It's going to be state of the art. He, he, he. I said, "Listen, I, I need to, I need to get another job. You mm -hmm. know, just you know, I won't interfere with you know ours." So he goes, oh, I know the athletic director at the International School of Kenya. So they got mostly Americans and embassy kids. So I talked to him. We hit it off. He offers me the, the girl's job and, and, then, and also coach the boys. My first week there, and I'd have to take like two buses through, oh, through like a jungle. You know, it's so crazy because they were way out of the way. So my first week there, I, I, I have a practice with the girls and I have I, I run these girls and at the end of practice, one of the girls says, Coach, you didn't run us enough. And, and the other girls say, Shh, don't say that. Just because yeah. you're a track, you know, she was a track star. Uh -huh. And I meet her mother and I meet her brother and, and everybody uh, on that Friday. That Saturday, I take my men from the academy to, uh, to the stadium, which is walking distance from where we lived, mm -hmm. for uh, a rugby tournament. New Zealand, England, everybody was in it. I kept getting these phone calls. And I didn't know the number, and it was just kept hanging up and no messages. I finally called back the number, and it was one of my girl players mm -hmm. saying, Coach, uh, we can't find Noriana. And Noriana was the girl I was talking about. I gave yeah. her a nickname called the – she looked like a little gingerbread cookie. And all the other, <laughs> the other girls were jealous. You know, They said, how come you don't give us nicknames? They, this is crazy. <laughs> uh, I hope I have sons, man. Daughters, I'm going to – I don't know. Anyway, so – they, she goes, we can't find Noriana. She's at the mall with her mother, and they said there's hostages at the mall, and her, her brother's there. And I go, ah, don't worry, it'll be okay. Well, that night I get a call from her, from the people at school saying that they, she was killed, you know, with her mother. Her brother was shot a couple of times, and uh, it, it, so many stories came out of that. that I I, could, I don't have enough time with, with you, but it, it was just the most oh, heart wrenching, no. most heart wrenching. Kidding. Jesus. The kids were devastated, to say the least. You know, Adrian, Adrian Wojnarowski calls me up, does a story for Yahoo Sports. I get in trouble for it because we're not supposed to publicize these kids' pictures and names because of the security and everything. And uh -huh. you know, it, it got tough, uh, and and it was. It, it, I I finally uh -huh. realized that you know I had to get the kids together somehow, and and you know, so I went to the bakery. I got a bunch of gingerbread cookies made. Mm -hmm. and put her number on it and we you know it, it was it was just really tough but it was a, it was a, it was an experience that you know I, I don't wish on anybody to lose a player and, and to lose a player that way and the funeral was, yeah. was spectacular and they were hindu and, and arabic mix you know so they weren't even supposed to be shot these these terrorists were, were shooting people that were non-muslim and, and asked them to recite the quran or who was uh, allah's mother and it was really there's so many stories the poor boy, ten year old kid, got shot twice, and oh, he played. De he so played sad. dead. He played dead, but he 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 got. It. They let him go. They let him go. But um, 
after after we won the championship, you know, we went to the we went to the African championships um, for the school in mm -hmm. in uh, in South Africa in Johannesburg. We went we went to the both teams went to the championship, and it was great. Wow. East East Africa Congrats. championship. So I did well there with those kids, and we won the championship in the um, academy in in the, the it's called the NBA the Ni Nairobi Basketball you know Association. Mm -hmm. and so when you win, you move up, and we were going to first division, but they wanted bribes, you know. It's 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 just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's when Robbie, the guy that brought me over there, says, you know, my team in England is looking for a coach. So they flew me out to England. I met the guy. He offered me two years, and from Kenya, I go to the United Kingdom. Yeah, to the BBL, right? The top league. Yeah. I remember that with Cheshire Cheshire Phoenix. That's right. Twenty six. We were twenty six and ten. We hit a shot that was a three pointer. He said he stepped out of bounds. Otherwise, we would have been in the finals. Wow! And coach, what year was that? Well, Africa was two thousand thirteen to two thousand fourteen. So I think it was two thousand fourteen, the fall. Okay. Yeah, because I remember when you know our, when we first met each other it was that two thousand fifteen year in the summer uh, during my camp and. Um, I remember you had been with the Cheshire Phoenix before that, and, and we yeah. were kind of talking uh, like at the tail end of that season before you came in that summer. So did you serve your two full years with them, no. or was that cut? No, they said because of financial reasons they can't afford me and some of my players that I had that brought over. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had Taylor King who went to Duke, who was the number one player yeah. in the country out of high school, McDonald's All-American. I had Dustin Salisbury from Temple. I had Julius Hodge, ACC Player of the Year, who played for me in the D-League, went to NC mm -hmm. State play for the Nuggets, you know, who, who yeah. gets these kinds of players in, to play in that league, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I had DeMond, I mean, DeMond Watt was was a great player, player of the month three times, and, you know, we had so much talent, you know, it's, uh, but it just didn't work out. I mean, we, we came close. I, had a, I, I loved it there. I loved it there. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah, that's a great league, and, and they're really emerging, too. English basketball is getting better. The BBL is getting better. Uh, you know, there's there's always been a battle there, obviously, for funding, um, but yeah. the, the attention is getting more, and you see more kids in basketball in the U.K. Yeah, oh, yeah. What you is know, different you know, an experience from, from you You were, you know, your first experience in the Middle East, second experience internationally is in is in Africa, and then all of a sudden, you know, you go to, to England. So, man, you, at this point, you are well-cultured. Well, I went from Africa being the only white guy in, in, in for, a, you know, in the league to yep. England where they speak English instead of Swahili, which mm -hmm. is okay. I learned that language, but it was basically predominantly a white country, you know, I mean, basically. Yep. And so it was, it was, a, you know, you had to keep adjusting. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it was, but to tell you the truth, it was a great experience. England was f fantastic. I, um, I made a lot of friends there. The fans were great. Um, and, and it's very underrated British basketball, mm -hmm. very underrated. Yeah, it's it, it it it. From what I'm told, that they used to have big time sponsors and TV contracts, and but when I was there, it was it, they didn't have any of that stuff, and it was a very competitive year, and and we 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 did well. So, coach, now uh, going from going from England, what was then your your next opportunity after that? Went back home, and then I got a job in the Republic of Georgia. Oh, that's right at the that the Zaza Pachulia uh, Academy, correct? Well, that was that was after that was after, okay. but my first job was a pro team. Oh, um, okay. So Kumi, and of course they didn't pay me, and not only didn't they pay me, they started making me coach the under sixteens, under eighteens, under twenties. You know, it, it, I was so burnt out. Yeah. And yep. and not getting paid, not getting. Yeah. It, it was only a thousand a month. That's the way it goes. They try to get everything they can out of you. And then once you finally can't take it anymore, they're just like, all right, you know. Next, we'll get yep. somebody else and yep. do the same exactly. routine. I brought in three players. They were all all-stars. One was the best player in the league, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't pay them either, so they, they held out. They, and they went to the house threatening them. They better, you know. It, it was just crazy. And then I, I, I asked again, does anybody, you know, I, I, what school does this kid go to? And he goes, oh, my, my school needs a high school coach. So I got the job at the International School in mm -hmm. Tbilisi. And at least I was getting paid American dollars on time. And um, they go, why do you want to coach here? Look at your resume. And I was like, ah, you know, I, to be honest with you, I could use the money. And I, and I want to coach kids. And, 
and we went we won the championship you know we won uh, we won a bunch of championships wow coach you man you yeah. keep even in the face of all this adversity you just keep finding ways to come over these obstacles and achieve great things overachieve probably with a lot of these teams that's why when people think that money is success it's not because i didn't have any right and you know but what i did have was kids that were willing to play hard and develop and to me mm -hmm. that was success and you know winning of course i love winning and every day and um, um, and then, and then I was approached by Zaza Pachulia's people to 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 work at the at the, at the academy. We, we at the time wasn't very big, but then it became so huge. And then I left. I got a job in China, and I left. Um, it was it was just a temporary job in China, but I had to leave in the middle of the season for Zaza. And uh, came back to school. I wasn't working for the pro team. I came back to Georgia, worked at the school. They gave me a substitute teaching job, which made it very, very attractive. And then Zaza, they asked me, um, Zaza himself asked me if I would coach his coaches and teach them the American way. And, right. and, I, and I said, well, I'm going to tell you something, Zaza. I'm not going to be easy on them because there's a lot of bad things going on here. Guys smoking cigarettes, guys screaming at little kids, guys leaning on the on on, on the basket, you know, just leaning their backs against the you know wall, yeah. guys on the phone. I said, I'm not having any of that. Yeah, I'm good gonna, for you. I'm gonna have meetings every every week. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell them we're gonna teach fundamentals, no games right away. And this is just and, and they, they got over a thousand kids now. He's got it going on there, man. But um, you know, it was a good experience. And uh, I met Zaza in LA during the game, took me back downstairs and I met everybody and it was cool, and um, so I spent three years there. And my my last finishing up my last year in uh, I think in between one of those years when I, I went to China twice for a, a basketball, mm -hmm. and then I went to Spain to work at an academy in the summer, which was a great experience. I love Spain, my favorite country visiting as far as just overall culture. Yeah. Um, Kenya was my greatest basketball uh, fulfilling uh, experience, but Spain was the, the nicest country. I loved it there, uh, especially the siestas, which you're cutting into my siesta right now, Chris, as we speak. <laughs> so I, while I was in Georgia, I went to Spain, I went to China twice, and then I'm lying in my apartment and I get a call from an agent. And the agent says, I got a job for you as a national coach. I said, wow, that's one of my dreams. I've always wanted to coach a national team. I said, I don't care if it's in, you know, um, Siberia, you know, I don't care. I don't yeah. care. And the agent says, well, it's a little warmer there. It, it's in the Maldives. You know, the Maldives. I said, you mean those islands that are sinking? <laughs> and I said, that's like paradise there. Yeah. yeah. It's a hundred percent Muslim country. Uh, their biggest guy is six foot three. <laughs> I, you're going to play against India that has all seven footers. And wow. I says, I'll take it, man. I'll take it. So again, I went there, and it was during the Arabic uh, holidays, and mm -hmm. we'd have to practice at midnight and eat right. afterwards. You know, when the sun was not, you know, up and drink, mm -hmm. and it was really, really great experience. Great experience. You know, we went to Bangladesh, and we went, we played in the gold round, and you know, we we beat Nepal, and we beat Bhutan, and we uh, who else did we beat? It was great, see, great, but they ran out of money, and I had to leave there. Wow, coach, you've been to some like you know. I've had some different experiences overseas, but nothing compares to a lot of the places and things that you've had. Um, now, you know, with that being said, obviously, I know who you are as, as such a great person, your personality. You're such a humble guy uh, and you give so much more than you take. But, you know, in these different experiences, it, it must have been very, very difficult for you. What type of advice? would you give to a coach? We talked a little bit about players, but for a coach that's going overseas into an experience like that. Yeah, I mean, similar similar advice uh, to the player. Um, do your homework mm -hmm. on the club. Talk to people that were previously there. Uh, don't sign. You know, you're not you're not officially um, they're not officially serious until they send you the plane ticket and visa. Right. In my opinion, when they send you a round trip plane ticket, and obviously get you know talk talk about the housing. Talk about, you know, you have to have a ton of questions. Yes. Um, if it's a place that's a little shaky as far as payments, you know, you got to you gotta weigh it. A lot, a lot of people are desperate and they'll take it. They'll say, I'll worry about it. They'll say, okay, but don't get mad. 
if you don't get paid, you know, just be prepared to spend your own money um, or budget yourself and um, or try to get like something on the side. Like in England, they make you work with kids. You know, you have to do coaching clinics, but that's part of it. So the, so the players are working with the coach, uh, the coaching kids that are paying money to the club so that they can pay the players for their basketball playing. Right. Right. So in other words, they're producing money so that they could get paid. Right. Yep. That's how it is so, in a lot of countries. Yeah, I mean, a lot of places have that where, where you um you have to do that extra work and um you know I always but the the thing about England was the thing about the United Kingdom was the club that I was at and I'm sure a lot of clubs are like this they kind of like adopted players you know they would take them out to dinner and and you know it, it, it's just so nice people. You just, mm-hmm. It's just that there was so much turnover, you really couldn't get close with the players. But right. for the players, you got to do your homework. Talk to former imports. Talk to former Americans or coaches and say, hey, how is it? Did you get paid on time? How's the housing? Yeah. How's the living conditions? You know, um, when do they practice? Can you, can, you, can you get extra work in? There's a lot of places, you know, Chris, you, you can't even get into a gym if you want to. That's true. Very true. You know, I mean... I think, you know, a lot of places, <laughs> they're lucky to get two two practices a week. That's true. You know, a lot of teams don't own their own gyms. They're renting it from a school or other sports that are bigger are competing. I know in England, you know, you're competing against sports like badminton that takes up a lot of gym time, you know. So it's completely different from what we're used to. But, Coach, again, to, to piggyback on what I was saying about, you know, who you are as a humble guy – Going through a lot of these difficult positions, what kind of kept you excited about going and taking another international opportunity? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. It was taking its toll on me and For my sure. family. For sure. My, 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 my siblings didn't want me to, try to go overseas anymore. They said, why do you keep doing this to yourself? You, you know, you keep not getting paid. Yep. You know, and I couldn't convince them to tell them, you know, it's, it's not about – even though I'm, I'm not happy about not getting paid. Right. I can live on pizza and hot dogs the rest of my life, but you know, it's not about that. It's, it's, it's the passion of coaching and, yeah. and, and I really enjoyed it, but it was taking its toll little by little, like, like in the Maldives, even though it was so beautiful and my sister and her husband visited me, it was so beautiful there, but you know, they, they weren't paying me on time. And, uh, um, we had a practice in this only gym in the country. Wow. Was in the capital. It was like a community center where everybody, they had netball, they had volleyball, they had everything there. Yep. So you, we had a practice like at 9, 10 at night. Golly. You know? And I had to take the ferry over there every night yep. from my island, you know. So, but, you know, you make a good point about the sports. Almost every country that I've coached in, basketball wasn't, even close to being the best, top sport. Perfect example: United Kingdom football. You're not gonna, you're not gonna out, out, outdo those guys. No, even no. From there to the Maldives, everywhere, all the countries in your overseas soccer is the is the king, man. Yep. Except, yep. except where well, I've never coached, but I will say, Lithuania basketball is number yeah. one. Basketball is big in Lithuania. It's so cold, you can't really play too much soccer out there. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll see other things like in, in the U.K., in those places, rugby is, is really big. Uh, basketball is not even secondary, third, fourth sometimes in a lot of these countries. So, you know, and, they, and the players there and the, the teams, other coaches, they take that attitude that it is just a hobby for a lot of them. Yeah. And when you come in and you try to be serious – uh, sometimes they look at you like, you know, what are you doing? It's very different. And I think people don't really understand that. Plus, along with what you said, don't understand the necessary things they need going into a job overseas. There's not an HR department that's going to take you through all your stuff. You have to make sure that you, they, they send you that visa. You get that contract. You get those flights. You have all your, your I's dotted and your T's crossed because it, if you go there with nothing, they'll keep you in that situation. And just try to use you, use you, and spit you out. No, and, and you know, obviously, you have a, a lot of experience, like I do. And you're right; uh, all these things you have to have done, and you should make a checklist. 
And you, but your ex, your expectation, you know, my expectations changed from mm-hmm. from the first team I dealt with in, mm-hmm. in in Qatar. I was even had a contract in Bahrain. You know, I had it. I had it contract with the seal and everything, but no plane ticket. I said, mm-hmm. you know, until I see that plane ticket, I'm not. You know, we're not agreeing. And and the other thing was, you know, as far as you know, getting all the things done, your expectations of them being like us. Business like getting it done, you know, yeah. they, they they won't call you back for weeks, yeah. like what, or, or or like okay, I'll I'll send it to you tomorrow, and you don't get it. It's, you know, they weren't they're not. You can't have those expectations. So, you have to get it all done, like you said yourself, and make sure. And also, you're you just can't expect it to be the same. You, we we just not we're not we're. We're, we're, we're wired differently here than we are over there. And, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, here you, you get a paycheck every whatever week of 15 days, monthly, whatever it goes into your account there. You got to sweat it. You yeah. got to sweat it. Especially as a foreigner, when you're not, uh, you don't have that type of social security. You're not, uh, you know, it, it's more, it's easier to, to pull one over on you when you're getting paid in, in cash or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and like you said before, when you were talking about if you had seen, you know, another coach that had been there, reach out to them. I remember personally, I was about to take a, uh, a small, you know, it was like maybe a month or two position in China. And I reached out to you actually about the people running it. And you said, no, you don't want to do this. Yeah. And boy, I you, were right. that. you were right. I didn't, I, I didn't. Cause I, I know I trust your word and, and you were right. Cause then I did my own research on it and oh boy, it was scary. It was yeah. scary. And, and, and you know, um, uh, sometimes people find out for themselves. I have to say that, like I say, Spain was the nicest place I've been to. Mm-hmm. The worst was China. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, it, it's it, like you say, you, you if they, the contract is, is worthless. You think that you sign a contract and, oh, you got to pay me. It's on the contract. What do you, you, you can't, they know you can't fight. Twelve hundred dollars a month. It can cost right. you fifteen thousand with FIBA to, to get the case seen. Right. And what's going to happen to them? Okay, you got to pay them. But then they stall. All the all the team folds and they change their name and then start yeah. up. A new, they have all the get. They know you're a foreigner. You're stuck there. You're in. The, you're there in the middle of the season. You can't go anywhere else. You're going to yeah. work for free. Pretty much, yeah. And the only teams that where you're getting paid enough to combat it are normally ones that are not doing that stuff, you know, because they've got, it's, it's more ran like in the States, you, you know, you're with the Euro league club, you're getting that salary, you know, you, you can expect things will go a little better. Although, you know, sometimes that happens there too. Um, yeah. You know, they do shady things as well, but uh, coach at this point, uh, where do, where do you go from here? You know, where, where does that, where does basketball take you at, at, at after that job, that, that last one we just spoke on? Maldives? Yes. So I meet with them. I meet with these people. I said, I'm going to go home for Christmas. And they said, well, we ran out of money. We have a new president of the uh, of the country and the budget's different. And I go, what are you kidding? What are you talking about? You have the money. You budgeted the money for a national coach, you know? So yeah. they, they were yeah. stealing the money. They were stealing the money. So, so, I, this is a I, so I came with some kind of an agreement with them, like a little package. I went home. And you... Tell me about this spot in Denmark. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So here's the contrast. I told you about the difference between Kenya and the United Kingdom, right? Yes. The, okay. Now I'm I'm in I'm in the Maldives, which is 100% Muslim. Mm-hmm. So you're not allowed to have pork products, bacon, sausage, unless you're you know at at the resort islands, which they have about 120 of those different one on each island. Yeah. And you, and there's no alcohol. None of that, right? Although I've seen many, many of the Maldivians drink, smoke. I heard they had a heroin pro- uh, problem. I couldn't believe yeah. it. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. But they, they, you know, they were in Thailand, and I was in Thailand, and I saw them drinking and chasing women, and you know, so they, they're, they're human beings, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, even when we traveled to India and Bangladesh, they were supposed to pray five times a day, but I never enforced it. You know, who, how can I enforce it? I'm not, you know, yeah. but. So in the Maldives, which is a very strict, believe it or not, country, highly influenced by Saudi Arabia and China, 
I get involved with the Denmark job, mm -hmm. thanks to you. And Denmark is a country where kids start drinking at the age of 14. Right. Completely right? different. All they're right? eating is pork. <laughs> pork? There's 15 million pigs to 5 million people. <laughs> yep. When I land, they buy me two hot dogs. Mm -hmm. It was delicious. I was hooked <laughs> on them. They knew whenever I got angry, they'd take me for hot dogs. I was like a junkie. <laughs> they knew how to shut me up. <laughs> and shut my arteries, too. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's funny. The, the, the European culture is very big with pork. Very big. Yeah. Oh, I can see why they drink. You drink the beer. Mm -hmm. So... And you know, it was nice people, Denmark, beautiful people, um, different. Everybody says it's the happiest place, but I, I just don't, I didn't understand it. And how can it be the happiest place if they have a high suicide rate, number one? Wow. I didn't how know can that. it be a happy place where people don't even say hello to you on the street? They, they yeah. just, and, 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 and it's not a rudeness where they're rude in a mean way. They're just rude because they're focused on, they, they, they're nothing around them, you know? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I would That's say hello to people. Yeah. yeah, I would, I would constantly try to be happy. And, and yeah, yeah, it was just like, you know, people weren't as friendly as I thought, but not in a bad way. They just were. That's the way they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it gets, you know, when I was there in the summer, <laughs> it it got dark for a couple of hours. But when when it started getting cold, it was getting it was getting dark like at two in the afternoon, and 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 I could see how it gets depressing. Yeah, for sure. When it's that cold and you don't have the sunlight, like you talk about places like that, Finland is is notorious for, you know, being very dark, very cold. Uh, same thing. I my former college coach, he said because he, he coached there in their top league for a number of years, and he talked about how depressed he would get because nobody would speak to each other. It was very dark, very cold, uh, and it was just completely different. And he was from Maine, you know, upstate Maine. So yeah, you know what I mean. Um, but so anyway, I, I, now yeah. I'm sorry, I mean, I, I, I've compared that to when I coached at Niagara, it would be yeah. so cold and dark and snowy up there. And, and I, I actually even, I don't drink. I actually had a few beers and I would go to the local pub that was down in my complex and just to, just to cheer me up. I watched all the people do karaoke. I was like, <laughs> Oh, I don't feel so bad now about myself. You know? <laughs> it was, it was like a booster. But yeah, and so I'm in Denmark, and um, I'm saying to myself, you know what? I'm done, man. I'm just mm -hmm. done. And we were winning. We had a good team. Um, we went. We, they moved up in, into Division One. I, I was, you know, I was like king there. But mm -hmm. again, they were a little negligent in, in, in our arrangements. And and right. even though I tried to work it out with them, they just were trying to avoid me. And um, I at the same time. It was like uh, early October, late September. Yeah. I get a call from a friend of mine who's running a, a big academy down here in Florida. Mm -hmm. He says, I need, I need a coach right away. Uh, you have to go through the process, drug testing, background check, fingerprints. How mm -hmm. soon can you get here? I said, I can be there in two weeks. Yeah. I packed all my stuff up. I took a train to Copenhagen. And I flew to London, Miami, Miami to Tampa, three flights. And I got here and I, I coached the team for, you know, for the season. And this is where I am now. And now I'm going to another academy, Knockwood. That <laughs> I, will, I will make an announcement soon. And uh, fingers crossed, uh, I'm going to probably try to stay close to home um, and hopefully settle down. In yeah, I don't blame you, Coach. And, and, and good luck and congratulations with that. Uh, that's awesome. You know, I feel like you're finally getting the, the stability and these, the opportunities that you deserve and where they really appreciate you. So I, I hope it works out more than it has with these international jobs. You know, um, um, the only, only things that I would not take this academy job would be if I go back into the NBA, mm -hmm. if – a big college job obviously came up and it said we need a head coach or an assistant coach mm -hmm. or the only overseas jobs right now I would consider it would have to be solid and maybe two places on my bucket list we had talked uh, off camera Italy and Australia yep are two dreams of mine 
where I would love to just settle down in one of those, you know I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. But uh, my mindset where I'm going to go, I'm a loyal guy and I'm going to be, you know, work, work my tail off. And, um, but that's the only other things that I would, you know, consider uh, down the road or whatever. It would have to be a, you know, almost a offer I can't refuse. Yeah, I understand, Coach. Especially, you know, once you've been through all those experiences, you know, and, and and me, I'm I'm 30 years old, and I haven't had a fraction of the coaching experience, the knowledge that you have. But I've already f feel like I'm worn out as well, you know, because it yeah. does take a toll on you. Uh, and and to kind of go back with what you said about you were you you were ready to take that flight and be gone. That's another piece of advice I would give to to a player or a coach that's going overseas. Have enough money in your account where you could hop on a flight. If, if it looks grim and it looks bad because you don't want to be trapped there. If you don't have enough to, to get a, to get a flight back home, then I would not say don't even take it because you, you, you could think you're getting into a good opportunity and it could turn. And I don't want to make this whole thing seem bad. There are many great teams out there. There's yeah. many great opportunities yeah. to take and positions. And, you know, we could speak to somebody else and they've probably had d way different experiences. Um, it's just unfortunately sometimes how it goes, you know, no, oh, um, you know there are some good people out there. There are basketball people out there. The yes. problem is some some clubs are run by non basketball people. Right. People that have never coached, never played. You know, and and yep. they just run it like uh, I don't know. They they run it like the way they think it should be run. And yep. um, you know, but uh, there are a lot of good clubs out there that do it right, know how to do it, and that's why they yep. win. And the yep. winning teams make the money, and money makes good teams, and and it's just like a cycle, you know. And exactly. Uh, you know, uh, but there is a there is a formula, and if you have the right formula, you could have a nice club that the community can rally behind, and you, know, you could settle down somewhere with a you know with a family, and and that's what I tell people: you know, work your way up. You, you know, go to a place your first job, and not not make you know don't worry about the money part the first year. Just build your resume and, and work your way up the ladder, and then find a place where you can settle down. But there are also red red flags that you need to you know um, pay attention to. Yeah. You know, the minute they they don't pay you, that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign, because in my opinion, a team should have all the money set aside for that imported player or yep. players and coach. They they shouldn't have to worry about it. It's got to be there already. Mm -hmm. You can't be chasing it. You know, and say, well, we'll make it on this. We'll make it on that. You know, we'll get more sponsors, or we'll you know sell tickets or whatever. So you can't, you can't, you can't play like that. That's not a, that's not a good business. You have to have it right. put aside. Right. And unfortunately, like you said, there's so many non-basketball people running things, and they're more like they're they're in that position because maybe they run a business, and then they try to run the basketball club like they run their business, where they're cutting corners, trying to take the cheapest routes, and that's not how you can run a successful, stable sporting environment. Yeah. You can't do it that way. You can't cut the corners. You can't take the cheapest route. You got to build the culture. There can't be high turnover, you know, because in the end, that's going to be more expensive for you. People are going to be angry. You'll never sustain success. You'll keep taking steps backward if you ever take a step forward. So I think you're, I think you're, you know, absolutely right with that, Coach. Uh, you know, before I before I let you go for your siesta, uh, is there any other advice or anything you'd like to like to say to any young players, any young coaches out there? You know, um, follow your dreams, chase your dreams. Don't let anybody stop you. Um, people have been trying to stop me for years. You know, think, saying that I should do something different or you know whatever. But you know, I I just I I can't I it's I, I'm gonna coach till I I'm not I'm not having any fun anymore. You know because. Um, I never ever wanted thought I'd get rich from this game. Um, I, I I've already saw seen so much in this world. I've made so many um, good people, uh, met them, and, and made friends, and um, you know a lifetime full of them. And um, there are gonna be times when you get knocked down. There's gonna be times when you be like, oh, I'll never, you know, it's not happening. Or there, it's true. The the odds are not favorable for a coach very few coaching jobs obviously right because mm -hmm. there's only one yep. coach and uh only one head coach when i was in the d league there was only 16 teams and mm -hmm. when i heard when i used to hear coaches complain 
I used to say, are you kidding me? We're, we're one of 16 head coaches in the NBA D League in the world. Yep. You know, so there's very limited. So, you know, opportunities are scarce. Players, too. There's very few jobs out there. There's a zillions of players. Right. Zillions. So, Especially for imports, there's there's not many. You, you might have one on a team. And if you're lucky enough to get those, man, don't take it lightly. Yeah, and you know the thing that I disagree with with, with the uh, overseas teams, they get caught up on stats. You know, I, I I don't I don't get caught up on if I see a kid that could play, there's, maybe there's a reason he doesn't score a lot of points. Maybe he's coming off the bench, or maybe he's just not involved in the in the offense. That don't bother me. If I could see he could play, he could play. Right. I had a guy in the D League that had two points a game in, with Oklahoma State, and he got called up with the Lakers. I mean, come on, man. Come yeah, on. yeah. They get caught up with, you know, it's got to be this NCAA D one tag. They don't see how a player can translate to their level. A lot of times you get some small school guys, you know, that can really play. And because they, they, you know, are not the biggest name player, they're not getting they're not getting that position, even though they could do damage in that league. Chris, I, I think I might have said to you this in the past. Some of my best players were from schools I never even heard of, you right. know. But I've also had, like I said, Duke, ACC players, yep. big time players. You know, I've had both. But the hungry guys... The guys that come there with a chip on their shoulder, the guys that are, you know, that are um, humble and and um, respectful and appreciative, those guys are gonna have a long. You have a long, long career. I look at some of these rosters. I'm like, who is this guy? I never heard of him. He's been mm -hmm. playing 12 years for this club because yeah. he know he knows he plays the game. Right. You have to play the game. Right. And I tell these young coaches and young players, a put a bio together with mm -hmm. videotape and find an agent. That you that that you know that is that works hard, you know, because some agents they'll have four or five point guards, and you know that's that's not good. You know, you they're trying to push five point guards, so find a good agent and and uh, and and put your bio together and have it ready when someone says, "Hey, can you have any film?" Send it to them right away. Be responsible. That impresses yeah. me. That impresses me. Uh, stats don't impress me, you know, but. If we got to play the game the right way, man, play the game the right way. This is a job, you know, it's a profession. Exactly. So you got to be professional. And what you're saying has to do a lot with, with character. I think guys who, you know, no matter where they came from, if they've got the character, then it normally translates to a, to a long career. Uh, you know, you, you just, you just reminded me of something else, Chris. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, sir. Um, if if you go overseas and you act inappropriately, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and you get in trouble, and you get sent home, your resume for the next job, a team's going to look and say, hey, why didn't he finish the season there? Did right. he get hurt? That's a red flag. Did he get in trouble? Was he not good enough? Mm -hmm. So my thing is, the reason you have to play the game the right way is because they look at your previous years. They look at where you've oh, yeah. played. And if there's a gap, if there's a blank, or what, any kind of discrepancy, they're going to scratch their heads, and they're going to ask you what happened. Yep. So you cannot, you know, you want to go to the clubs after a game or at night, and, you know, you better be careful. You better be careful because, you know, especially being um, an American, you, you're spotted right away. You're spotted right away. Oh yeah, that big tall American. He was at. He was there at that fight. Mm -hmm. You know, he was there. And, or, or you know, um, you, you get in trouble. You, you you could ruin your career for one night. Yeah, one you're night. right, coach. You're right. You got to treat it as a business. You you are building your brand, and you've got to be professional. You're not in college anymore. College, you got to be more professional. But you're not there where you have the security. You're going to be there maybe for four years and. You can go out with your friends. It's completely different, completely different. Like you said, that guy that they're paying the most or that they brought in when other guys are, are amateur or semi-pro or they're expecting you to be the best player, you're the, also the first one they're going to replace. Exactly. Not the local kid that you know they need to, to be on the floor at all times to fill the rules. Uh, so you're right, Coach, 100%. Um, have high, and although, expectations. Like said, high expectations for yes. the imports. Yes. You know, exactly. They're paying you the money. They're paying you the money. I remember in China, the, the the GM says your two Americans have to 
have to score 30, 65 points between them. I was like, what? I had two NBA guys. Josh Powell was one mm-hmm. of them. And, uh, you know, uh, I was like, what? And they go, yeah, we're paying them 50000 a month. You know, the other guys are not making, they're making very little. Mm-hmm. They have to do this. Otherwise, they're gone. We're going to bring in somebody else. And they could afford it. But some teams can't. They, their right. flights cost a lot of money. So you, you, this, you're, you're under the microscope. You know, you think that you're, you know, you're, you're this and you're all that. But <laughs> you're interchangeable. You, yeah, you are. You, you, they'll get somebody else for cheaper. And if they're not winning, they definitely get rid of you because you're the first to go. Even if you're scoring exactly. 30 points a game. If you're not winning, hey, we're not winning with them. Let's save the money. Exactly. Well, Coach, you know, like you said, basketball doesn't always make your, your pockets fatter. But I think, you know, for, for you, and, and I, I believe this too, it's like the, you have so much wealth in, in, in here and in here because of your experiences, the culture that you've been able to, to bring to yourself from all these world experiences, the people you've met, the, the lives that you've touched and influenced in such a positive way. Um, you know, you've done way more than somebody who's who's just kind of been in in their dead end job making that secure stable you know money their their entire life and I think that is is definitely worth pursuing your passion for and it's more fulfilling uh, to to lead that life than it is to to work a job that you hate. Yeah, I agree. You know, if you if you love what you're doing, it makes it all. Listen, there's times when you get out of bed and you don't want to go to practice or something like that, but you push yourself. There's times like that. I, I mean, uh, and you're going to have some guys that really challenge you, which I've had. If you coach long enough, you're going to have your run-ins with guys. It's mm-hmm. not, not for everybody. But you learn. You learn how to deal with things. And, and you, you want to send the right message and, and give the right lessons and um, you know, try to win at the same time. But basically, it's, it's all the relationships to me are, are, are so meaningful. And, and I still, to this day, talk to guys from – 20 years ago, 25 years ago. So it's great. Yeah, definitely coach. And and that's a testament to, to the type of person you are. I know that you've probably touched so many, so many lives and that's why they continue to stay in touch with you. Um, and you know, to, to, I'm sorry to cut you off to, to wrap it up. I don't want to waste so much of your time. I really appreciate this has been the best interview that I've done. I, I really appreciate everything that you've shared with me and the viewers uh, as far as your experience, both good and bad. Uh, and just like the, the knowledge of what to do, what not to do. Um, it, again, it's just a testament to who you are. Always trying to help people. Oh, you know, the, the, the level of humility uh, and character you have is, is amazing. And you've always been a mentor to me. So I really appreciate that as well. Well, that's, I, that's very nice of you. And, uh, you know, you, be yourself. That's all I say. You know, you got to be who you are and, and uh, the team will take on your personality you know, so everything rubs off on the team. And if you work hard and you're hum- humble and honest and, you know, you have that, you know, um, uh, that persona where, where people w- want to be that way, that your team's going to be that way. If, if, if you're a dog, they're going to be dogs. You know, that's the way it is. It's just uh, just be as transparent as you can. Exactly. Again, thank you so much, Coach. I wish you the best with your new station. And, uh, you know, congrats and, and good luck. And I know that you're going to do some amazing things. And I can't wait to keep up with you and hear, you know, everything that's going on. Same here, Chris, man. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you real soon and uh, keep pushing. You know, don't, you know those, are, those are just a little anything life throws at you. I know you, you, you'll come through. And uh, I look forward to hearing about your tales next time we speak. Thank you very much, Coach. All right. See you, Chris. Take care.